Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, EBSD Analysis of Deformed Microstructures. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are several application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We'll try to answer these at the end of the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or run out of time, you will receive an answer via email. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon in the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Stuart Wright, who is our presenter for today's webinar. Stuart was first introduced to EBSD as an undergraduate student at Brigham Young University, working with the first system in North America. He then moved to Yale University to pursue a PhD under Professor Brent Adams. His thesis research focused on automating the EBSD technique. This effort led to the first fully automated EBSD scans in the fall of 1991. After graduating, Stewart joined Los Alamos National Lab and continued work in microtexture and texture analysis using both the OIM technique and conventional X-ray diffraction. Shortly after, TSL was founded. Stewart left Los Alamos and joined the startup company, commercializing the OIM technique, working primarily on software development. He has continued in this role through the purchase of TSL by EDAX. The original OIM system at Yale could index approximately one pattern in three seconds. Modern systems have come a long way since those early days with speeds now exceeding 4,500 index patterns per second. Stuart is closely involved in the continued development of the technique, as well as in working with scientists all over the world in applying the technique to their materials research. Now over to Stuart. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending our webinar today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, analysis of deformed microstructures focusing on plastic strain. Um, but as part of that, if you look at a, do a Google Scholar search or some of the other uh, scientific literature search engines, you'll find that most of the EBSD papers, or at least a large majority, are focused on deformation. Um, and in fact, I just returned from the TMS meeting in San Diego this week. And even in those areas that aren't necessarily, you might not think of deformation, often if there's any EBSD works, there's still some of the tools that we are being used that we use to examine deformation and plastic strain. Um, in today's presentation, I'll be focusing, I'll give a review on some of the, the tools we have in the OIM analysis software for analyzing strain materials. And specifically, I'll be looking at using the G-ROD map or G-R-O-D maps. I'll explain what those are. And then we'll take a brief look at GNDs, gen, gen, geometrically necessary dislocation density, and uh, step size effects, uh, noise effects, and then also look at Taylor and Schmidt factors because they also can play a role in interpreting the results. And then also I wanted to talk about some of the complementary techniques that are becoming more and more common and provide us a, a, a broader picture of, of strain. Uh, some of this, or quite a bit of the background information of this is in a paper that we wrote in 2011 in Microscopy and Microanalysis, and that's a good source of information in, in terms of the tools that, that we have for analyzing strain materials. And also uh, gave a webinar a few years ago on similar kind of information, um, more focused on the tools in, in besides uh, GROD, which was new at the time. So without that, that, without further ado, we'll go ahead and follow that outline. So I often get asked uh, if we can measure strain using EBSD, but strain is a little bit of an ambiguous term. It can mean a lot of different things. Um, there's, I'm going to break it down into two parts, elastic strain. It's important to remember that elastic strain is a second rank tensor, not simply a scalar value. And plastic strain, which also is a tensor, but also we consider other values of interest, um, which are scalar values, things like stored energy and dislocation density. 
And so I'll talk about some of these differences and, and why this is all important. So when we think of plastic strain, we think of dislocations in the crystal lattice, and they can affect patterns in, in two different ways. If you have a set of uh, aligned dislocations that say a subgrain boundary, um, then those you could will create a, a local misorientation within the microstructure. Whereas you may have local perturbations, which also create local misorientations, but somewhat in a shorter, uh, smaller order, and sometimes they can cancel each other out, as I've tried to show here. So think of these uh, these local perturbations. Um, they can have you can actually have a significant amount of dislocation density, but you could have a net Burgers vector of zero. And we refer to these as statistically stored dislocations or SSDs, and they will lead to degraded pattern quality, so lower IQ values. Um, the view on the right showing the dislocations is definitely exaggerated. Um, we don't have that kind of resolution with EBSD, but just trying to get the point across that we have a disturbed crystal lattice, and that does affect essentially um, the Bragg angle um, for those, those crystal planes. Now, if you do have a set of dislocations that, that form uh, maybe an ordered structure that creates some changes in crystallographic orientation within the, the lattice in a, in a large enough area, then you can get different patterns from different areas. Is, is what I'm trying to show in this, this little schematic. So if, if the diffraction volume were to include that dislocation line there of four degrees, then you would basically have a merging of all the patterns together, which would lead to a lower quality diffraction pattern. As I tried to show there's a pattern for the blue, the red, and the green. And if the diffraction volume contains all of that, then you would see a, a merged pattern or, or superposed pattern. Now, if your diffraction volume or is interaction volume is small enough, then you would be able to pick up each one of those individual orientations. And we actually see both effects in our EBSD results. So what can we do within individual patterns um, and in terms of a quantitative analysis? Now, this work was is, is done by Angus Wilkinson at Oxford University and has done, been a pioneer in this area. And there's been others who have followed it up on this, some of his students as well as others. So in his work, you compare two patterns. So in this case, I've, I've just manually rotated a pattern two degrees and, and just to show the idea. Um, but you could also not just have a simple rotation, you could have a change in, in the zone axis positions due to elastic string. And in that case, it, it's a, the lattice is being stretched as opposed to the dislocations where we have a plastic string I showed before. So Wilkinson's method, and I put a, a, one of his references there, but he's got quite a few really good papers on this subject. Um, he the idea is that you create several regions of interest on the pattern. I just show it systematically. They usually overlap. Um, and you calculate cross correlations within each one of these regions of interest that I tried to show there. And from those, you get a little, you'll see a shift. And this is generally at the subpixel range. These are very small uh, shifts. And for that, you essentially get a vector. So you end up with a displacement gradient uh, tensor um, using all the vectors in the pattern. And from that, you can split it up into different parts, the elastic parts and the plastic spark parts that I've tried to show here. Um, the elastic parts are these, um, or, or the anti-symmetric part of the rotations, I, that is the plastic parts, and they're associated with geometrically necessarily dislocations. The symmetric parts are the, the elastic strain tensor. And so this is a, you'll note this is a relative measure because we have to compare patterns but progress is being made to try to go towards an absolute measure. This is still very, uh, it's been around for about, you'll saw, see from the references, more than a decade now, and it's becoming more well accepted in the, in the EBSD community. There is an iterative method um, that the attempt is to eliminate a need for a reference pattern. So you, the idea is that you take a pattern, you index it, and from that you simulate a pattern. And then you try to do that iteratively and fit the, uh, the displacement gradient tensor. Um, but it's very sensitive to calibration simulation. This is very much uh, continues to be a research area. Um, but it's improving because of 
the also emergence of more dynamic simulated um, patterns um, so that you can see uh, through a dynamic simulation you're able to create uh, pattern simulations that are much better than we had um, uh, previously and they look very much more like uh, experimental EBSD patterns but I won't belabor this there's there's lots of research in, and um, areas that you, that you can search the literature for work in this area just to show that the effect of how the effectiveness of the technique if you uh, measure the strains then you you can map them out from many patterns and here's a hardness indent in silicon and you can see the strain fields that develop um, and the different uh, components of the strain tensor um, as well as the rotations and this gives a very nice result and this show the result here I'm showing is from the DLG website here's a, an example of comparing HREBS this technique is called HREBSD and here it is versus the conventional KAM which is will be the focus of, of my presentation I just wanted to give you an idea of what's going on with HREBSD because it is I'm seeing it more and more pre presentations at the conferences and is a, a good development for EBSD um, there is a commercial system cross court you can see a reference there if you want to look or an open source system um, on github um, the, so let me come back to more what we would do with conventional indexing and what we can learn about plastic strain so as I pointed out strain kind of manifests itself two ways in the EBSD um, in the patterns one is that you have a degradation of pattern quality and seen in the top row there for the blue point or um, just slight changes in orientation even though the pattern quality can remain relatively good especially for uh, small um, small levels of plastic strain then you get just slight changes in orientation and you can see that and those two patterns are if you look very closely are actually just slightly different from each other indicating a change in orientation so this shows up in the maps in a couple of different ways so if we focus on pattern quality then you'll notice in this map it's a uh, partially recrystallized material you'll notice the dark regions are the strained areas and the light regions are the recrystallized grains um, and that is quite apparent in this in this map but it's also apparent if we look at changes in orientation so in this case it's a standard IPF map inverse pull figure map showing the orientation as a as a color and you can see in those strained areas that the orientation can change quite a bit from uh, one end of the grain to the other end of the strained grain and whereas the recrystallized grains the color is solid so those subtle changes in color tell us that the um, there's strain there and um, we can be quantitative about this so as I mentioned plastic strain is very evident in the IQ maps but there's a lot of other things that create um, contrast in the IQ maps um, one is clearly sample prep and that is actually an indication of strain the other thing is that if you have second phases they often sh show up in IQ maps as, as lower or higher um, uh, intensity due to the nature of the, of the second phases versus the matrix phase cracks obviously show up pores grain boundaries show up so that's a problem because grain boundaries would appear to be strained material when it's just a, a grain boundary effect and so strain is actually a lower order effect that we would see in the patterns um, so even grain size you can see here can have effects um, and even orientation so these can be pretty subtle and they are all effects that we can see in, in an IQ map now local misorientations also show up um, EBD, EBSD is quite good at identifying local misorientations um, conservatively 0.5 degrees is, is achievable but um, with, with a little bit of care you can get down to, to you know around 0.1 degree in terms of misorientation at least with this technique uh, with, with standard Huff based um, indexing mapping methods um, so there's a lot of different methods of trying to to characterize these misorientations because you'll see the grouping of misorientations in this case the, the red uh, the red boundary segments indicate uh, low angle misorientations and you can see those in those different grains so we have different ways of analyzing that we have what we call kernel or window based techniques um, the most popular being CAM 
external average misorientation, which I'll explain what that is. But there are others that I that I refer you to the references I gave at the at the beginning on the outline um, to get more information on some of the alternative approaches. The other grain-based ones, GOS, GAM, um, and I'll talk a bit about GOS and introduce that. But once again, for the others, go ahead and and go to the paper um, that I referenced earlier. Um, there's another one called reference, uh, what I call reference orientation based, um, or GROD, G grain reference orientation deviation. I'll explain what that is. And there's a lot of different forms of that. So let's look at the CAM, kernel average misorientation. The idea here is, is you have a kernel of points. For this case, I'm showing them points collected of, on hexagonal grid in the scan. And what we do is we calculate the, air, the angular deviation from a point at the center of the kernel. Um, and usually we look at the ones on the perimeter, as I've shown there. But usually we're looking at nearest neighbors. So you can, you can, do, you can go out as many neighbors as you want. Um, obviously, the nearest neighbors is the closest you can do. And you calculate all these uh, orientation deviations. And then you calculate the average, and you color the point according to that average. So in the map at the right there, the blue points have a very low uh, kernel average misorientation. And the, uh, as you move towards red, those are points that have a high kernel average misorientation. So the points in red are areas that have a lot of change, a local misorientation, which is an indicator of plastic strain in the material. And you repeat, repeat that. I've, it failed to mention, you repeat that for each point in the data set. Now, another one is we call the grain orientation spread. This is a grain-based idea. So you have to uh, first partition your points into grains using our standard um, grain reconstruction approaches um, based on the nearest neighbor uh, misorientation. So the first step in this is you calculate the average orientation for a grain. And then what you do is for each point in that grain, you calculate the deviation in um, orientation from the average. And then you, um, you calculate the average of all those, and that gives you this grain orientation spread, or GOS. And so each point in the grain, in this case, gets the same color, um, and because you're just looking at the average. And once again, we repeat that for each grain in the data set, and then we end up with a map where each grain is colored according to this average deviation. So you can see which grains have a lot of misorientation in them, and local changes in orientation versus those grains that may be very clean um, and recrystallized grains, for example. Now there's another grain-based one, but now instead of each point getting the same color, we're gonna allow some deviation. So one approach to this is to calculate, once again, an average orientation for the grain. And then you calculate the deviation at each point from the average. But instead of assigning each point that average value, you actually color each point according to that deviation. And so what you see in, in that little example schematic there, you'll see that the blue grain is one where it's very close to the average orientation of the grain, whereas the red one is quite far away, five degrees. And those can actually be quite large at times in a very um, strained material. And once again, repeat for each grain of the data set. So this is the kind of map you might see. And what does it show? So originally, I thought of these showing the change in orientation relative to the grain orientation prior to deformation. But I'm going to explain why that isn't quite true. And much of this is covered in a JOM uh, paper we wrote a few years back. So here's an experiment that we've done using a uh, in situ tensile stage. Um, where we can, you can see that sample can be tilted in that stage and a little dog bone there. And then we can, we can monitor um, using EBSD the changes in orientation as the material is strained. So just to show you, here's the force displacement curve. Um, we scan in a, a relatively small area because we want to see what's going on within the grains and we want to do it fast enough that we capture it. So um, we repeatedly scan the, that area that you see there um, after 1% uh, change um, in displacement, in elongation. 
Um, we actually, our, our initial point, our zero point is actually after just loading it up. Um, so there is, it isn't exactly zero, zero, uh, zero percent strain, just so you're aware of that. So here's the inverse pull figure maps, the standard kind of color maps you see, and you'll see two effects. Um, you do see some change in the image quality, um, and that is somewhat due to repeatedly scanning the same area. Um, I'm not sure quite why we see the dark points coming up more and more, but that is what we see. But you'll also see something I think more critical is you start to see some subtle changes in color, and this is what we're going to focus on with our, our tools because these are in, the change in color is a change in orientation. So I mentioned the kernel average misorientation maps. Here they are for this um, going um, from 0% to 10% strain. So the first one is the top row is our, our nearest neighbors, the first orders. And you can see some change there, but it's not a whole lot of development. It's, the step size is too fine to really pick up any big changes. We're near the order, order of the pre precision at that point, And I'll come back to that point later in the presentation. Now, the second row, our fifth order, which is a relatively large, so fifth nearest neighbors, which corresponds to a half of a micron step. And then you can see some development in the strain uh, kind of flow fields within, within the material, within the microstructure. Um, one point that comes out immediately is that it is sensitive to step size, and I'll come back to that in more detail. So here's the G-Rod maps, the grain reference orientation deviation maps, where we're comparing the orientation at each point relative to the average orientation for the grain. And you'll see that develop quite nicely. You can see, so areas in blue will be very near the average orientation of the grain, and areas in red are quite far away from the average orientation of the grain. In this case, almost nine degrees. And so you can see kind of a band in the center of that large grain at the center of the scan area we're looking at here um, is quite close to the average orientation. And then as you move to the left and the right of that, you can see a rotations away from that average orientation, kind of suggesting that the grain is bending away from, the, from that center orientation. Um, just the usual notes, um, all the usual caveats apply with a free surface. Um, that's what we can do in situ. We can't look in the bulk with EBSD, so we, we certainly know that, that it isn't necessarily completely representative of the bulk, but we hope it gives us some indication of what's happening. Um, we're going to focus on the data set at 10% strain um, because that's the critical one and compare it to the one at 0% strain. Um, there's lots of ways you can select that reference orientation. So I've in this case, we focused on the average orientation for the grain. That isn't necessarily the only one you can use. Um, so there's two that we have suggested. Um, one is the average, and that goes back to some old, old ideas that we originally got started with um, with EBSD, um, even, even before the paper I show there, even though that's one of the earliest. Um, but there is another one. We could use the orientation of the point in the grain with the smallest cam. The smallest cam would indicate a point maybe that hasn't gone through much plastic strain and may be closest to the original um, orientation. And that is something you can certainly do. Um, and it comes with, with various challenges, but um, it, it's one that, that we found this works as well. Some others have been suggested by other authors using the point in the grain with the maximum confidence index, the one with the maximum image quality, the one with the best fit. And all these go back to the idea that these would be related to the point in the grain um, that most likely is closest to the original orientation of the grain. Um, some others um, go to minimize the, the overall deviation or maximize the overall deviation. Um, and then we've also thought, why not use the one closest to the geometric center of the grain? Just um, not so much that it matches the original orientation of the grain, but in the sense that it gives us an idea of what's happening um, at the edges of the grain versus the interior. So here's different maps, and you can see them all here. You can see some are similar, some are quite different, um, and where they, they show the maximum orientation happening. And that's not a surprise. Um, you can see that the largest misorientation in this case would be 12 degrees obviously for the one where we're trying to create the most misorientation for the G-Rod max dev as I shown there. So 
I mentioned that we're, we may be trying to find the pre-deformation orientation um, with these maps, and all these are like, as I explained before, are created to try to get that idea. So, but what are we really trying to measure? We're trying to capture the change in orientation with respect to the grain rotation prior to the deformation, then our in-situ data can help us determine which is the best um, measure for capturing that. So for each grain in the, in the scan, we can compare to the reference orientation, of the corresponding grain um, in the 0% strain scan, which I've tried to show here. And you can see, i calling that G-Rod 0, um, and you can see the result here. You can see there's a lot less strain in the material um, than, than we get if we use the, some of the other measures we talked about. Um, just as a note, it's not necessarily easy to do this point-by-point -point comparison between the scans that say 10% and 0% because the sample is moving as you deform it, especially in a tensile. Um, we may not be right at the center of our area, and so you can see that in this case we have a slight shift. Um, I've corrected for that shift and then also done a few tricks because obviously the grains are changing shape also as we deform, and so I've kind of had to do a little trick to try to fill in. It's a little easy in this case because if I assume the G rod zero is the same orientation within the grain, um, which it pretty much is um, at 0% strain, then I can use that. Now, if I, my starting material was, a, was had more strain in it, I couldn't make that assumption. So here's our G rod zero. So comparing the 10% versus 0% strain map down at the bottom right. And if you look at that, you can see which one maybe matches the best. Uh, I would say the MinDev, the average works pretty well. The, the, actually, the Centroid works pretty well. Um, but some of the others are, are quite different. And so you can interpret that and, and try to understand that. Um, but what does it really mean that none of them match perfectly? Well, I think what we're learning is, is that the G-Rod Zero map tends to show us the more general change in orientation. That is the independent rotation, the rigid body rotation of the material as a whole. Um, the other maps tend to emphasize the fragmentation that occurs during deformation as the material tries to maintain structural compatibility with neighboring grains, all of which are also rotated, so more like the SACS model. Um, those of you not familiar with this, um, the SACS model is a uniform stress model, an ISO stress, so each grain it's assumed that each grain of the material undergoes, has the same amount of stress during deformation. And what that results in is, is that you have variable strain um, within the material. And so you start to lose incompatibility is the weakness of that. Now, the Taylor approach assumes isol strain so that each grain has the same amount of strain in the material, but variable stress. And that leads to a, you have a compatibility, you, you get rid of the compatibility issue. And you can see some of these effects and this is well understood with slip lines and other types of analysis, which I will actually come back to it. Um, and so our, if we go back to the previous slide, you can see that the idea that the Taylor model would be uniform strain within the material, whereas in order to make the Sachs model work in a sense, you would have to have different amounts of strain in the material. So our G-Rod maps give us some insight into how strain is happening. Um, as I mentioned, the G-Rod zero shows the overall deviation, and whereas the others show the fragmentation. The other uh, G-Rod maps um, provide that fragmentation um, picture. Um, it's not a valid assumption that the points of the orientations near the reference orientation are um, represent material that's stationary, um, but it does give us an interesting picture. And also, it's always important to remember when looking at these types of maps, um, about plastic strain, that they provide a description of the current state of the material, but may not always provide us a, a historical er evolutionary context um, of the material as it, as, it, as it moved towards that state. Um, some interesting things, um, we also, look, in this material, we looked at the misorientation of the grain boundaries. You can see for that red grain boundary, it really changed orientation quite a bit as the two grains are moving away from each other. Um, other boundaries, the grains tend to seem to have moved um, in a more compatible way. Um, and you can see, for example, the, the blue one hasn't changed a whole lot in orientation. 
Um, but it's also important to recognize that um, that the changes in misorientation is seem to be greater than we assume from the GROD map. You know, you're seeing misorientations here, a fairly large amount, um, more than what we were seeing within the grain itself. Um, but we have to remember that the angle is only in one part of the misorientation. We ha also have to consider the axis of rotation. And if you do that, you get these kind of maps. So here we're showing the um, rotation axis, the top row in crystal space. So for example, the points colored in blue are points where the rotation is about the 1, one axis, points in red are rotations about the 0, 001 axis. And you can also plot these then in, in sample space. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. I'm just showing one example here. So grains um, that are very sharp in color, the um, rotation axis is, is pretty much lies within the plane. As you move towards white and perfectly white, the rotation axis would be uh, normal to the plane of measurement. And so you can see that development there as well. And there's a lot of interesting things going on. I won't go into any detail of that analysis. We've tried to start to look at that, um, but it, it provides an interesting picture. Um, if, if you zoom in on this a little bit, uh, there's something that I would call a misorientation degeneracy, or at least for the axis. Um, as, the, as the misorientation gets small, the axis is not well-defined, and we're also reaching the precision limits of our measurement technique. And you can see that in these maps. You'll see that the points are not well-defined here in this circle. Um, so the, the G-Rod angle map is blue, indicating very little misorientation. You can see the points are speckled there. The colors aren't consistent. But in area, the other areas um, where the misorientation is large, like um, in the yellow-orange area there, that you can see the axis is well-defined. And it also seems to give us some indication of maybe some uh, subgrain development as well. Um, and so we're kind of excited about this technique and, and seeing more and more people using it to examine the, the evolution of, of, of strain in the material. So can we do something even more quantitative? Can we look at geometrically necessary dislocations? So geometrically necessary dislocations are those essentially that give us the rotation um, we, that we see from from pattern to pattern within within an individual grain. So how do we get from, from orientation A to orientation B? And it's basically a ge geometrically dislocation, necessary dislocation. And so they can be connected to the orientation, especially the orientation gradient, measured at a point by EBSD. So if we express the change in orientation with our vector G, I give you a few equations here. Um, my advisor taught me I should always show an equation or two in a presentation, or it's not a real presentation, sorry. <laughs> um, but we can connect the nigh dislocation tensor to the um, orientation gradient through that permutation tensor there. The nigh dislocation tensor is, is alpha. And that can then in turn be um, connected to the, the density of dislocation um, by the, the summation equation there, where rho is the scalar dislocation density. And um, the couplet uh, B and Z um, tell us about the dislocation type, where B is the Burgers vector and Z is the line direction. So what that means is we have a, if you can imagine collecting data on a square grid, we can interpolate it from a hexagonal grid as well. Then you basically have a misorientation between a point and its neighbors. Um, we can just focus, I mean, typically you would just focus on the one to the right and the one below but we can actually create a little bit better if we consider the others and do a little bit of a curve fit, if you will. Now, this is a three-dimensional quantity, and so if we were to do some kind of 3D serial sectioning, you could pick that up and add that too, but we will focus just on the in-plane uh, measurement. So from that, you basically end up with a map that looks like that. Obviously, from the previous slide, it's gonna be closely related to the CAM. What we do have to enter is the slip system, and so you will end up with different GND density maps um, depending on what slip system you use. Um, but but you, regardless, they will be quite similar to the CAM, basically scaled by the step size. Um, just as a, there was a really good talk that I remember Stefan Zephyr gave. Stefan is at the Mox Plock Institute, in, um, or when he gave this at the Mox Plock Institute um, for steel research in Germany, at Dusseldorf. 
Um, and, and he points out that both geometrically distant necessary dislocations and the statistically stored dislocations, SSDs, are they're a direct indication of plastic flow, or neither are a direct indication of plastic flow because they're they're stored, they're immobile. And so they do indicate the heterogeneity of flow, which we certainly see. Um, but he surmises that they are only a small fraction of stored dislocations, around 10%. Other authors have indicated different uh, feelings about that, but it's something you kind of should keep in the back of your head as you do this. But GND density depends upon um, the measurement conditions, step size, um, angular precision, and I'll come to those points. Um, but the, regardless of, of, of those maybe things that we don't necessarily always understand, they are always interesting because they do give us the indication of plastic activity at obstacles. For example, we see pileup at crane boundaries. Um, and they are obviously areas of high dislocation, areas of, say, nucleation for recrystallization or potentially um, corrosion or, or other things. So they are important and do give us lots of information, even if quantitatively we may not be exact. Um, just as an example, here's some 3D um, results from uh, Stefan's group um, showing uh, dislocation of different kinds um, within a within a block of material. Okay, so what are the step size effects? And I just show a quick example there in the title slide. Um, here's some experiments on cold rolled brass. We did two different sets of experiments: one at 250 nanometer step sizes and one at 20 nanometer step sizes. And then using coarsening of the data, we can actually you know pick up some other step sizes. So there's um, three different scans here, 30%, uh, 20%, oh, there's four, sorry, 30%, 20%, 11%, 4.5% 5 cold work. Um, and then you can you can see that the measured GND from our measurement, uh, EBSD measurements goes up as the step size goes down, um, that you see there. Um, and so it's clearly step size dependent. And you can see that in the, in the CAM results. So you can see on the left are the nearest neighbors, and the ones on the right are the fifth nearest neighbors. And so the ones on the left are, start, are pretty noisy. And that's because as I go to the nearest step size, the misorientations are small. I'm starting to reach the limits of the EBSD precision. As I go to larger step sizes, the misorientations are, tend to be larger. And so I pick those up clearer, and so I tend to get a little bit cleaner results. Um, Regardless, you can see some of the same features develop, which is good, even though the step size and so maybe the the, uh, the magnitude differs, um, you do see some of the same features regardless of the step size used. So why does this happen? One is a precision issue, which I referred to and I'll come back to, but also is, is because of the, of the relationship of SSDs. Imagine that you had a row of dislocations. You measure the misorientation at one side, and you measure the misorientation of the other side, and from those you calculate the GNDs, you can see that a coarser grid or larger step size, you would pick up the misorientation well, as indicated by the green line. So if I had a large step size, I would get a larger misorientation from the um, two endpoints. Um, but if I had a lot of SSDs um, canceling, essentially canceling each other out, then my overall misorientation would be small for my, you know, the two endpoints, and so my coarser grid size wouldn't really help me. Um, and that's, in, and so we believe what we, remember we're measuring GNDs. We're not measuring dislocations per se individually, we're measuring them more um, based on the change in orientation. So that's the point to remember here. So what we find is the smaller step sizes produce from our cams, so we have a smaller step size, and so um, we are more sensitive to the orientation noise. So this is more of an issue at low levels of strain. Um, and more strain generally, the other challenge we have is more strain generally means noisier patterns. So our precision also drops off as we have more strain. And if this is really a big issue in your material, then you should probably try the, the HREBST techniques I referred to at the beginning of this presentation. So what about noise effects? I've, I've alluded to this, and it is something we have to consider. Um, much of what I will talk about is, is from a paper that we wrote um, in two, uh, and some of what I wrote about is a paper wrote in 2015, but some others I'll reference as well. So we know that as 
as we get more strain, our patterns get poorer. And so this results in, in our uh, less of ability to precisely uh, locate the uh, bands and the patterns using the Huff transform, which leads to more noise in the orientation measurement. So as an example, here's just a single crystal silicon. Um, and if we analyze that, you can see it's a tight cluster for that um, set of measurements. It's a pretty big scan. That's part of the reason for the imprecision. Um, but you can see it's pretty tight around the center. This is an 001 pull figure um, for, for this material. And so you can see it's a tight cluster. Uh, notice the pull figure goes out to only two degrees, not the full pull figure that in the bottom left. Now, if we add noise to the patterns, I'm just simply add a Gaussian initialist example. Um, if we add a certain amount of noise, then you can see that that cluster isn't nearly as tight. There's there's more noise in the pattern. So as we increase noise, um, pattern the precision goes down. So in cam maps, we often see that the cam values are higher near grain boundaries. And so we were interested to see is this real? We would suspect it could be real. Dislocation pile up at grain boundaries certainly could happen. Um, and so, or is it just an artifact of imprecision? So we've looked at this in detail, and this is because there is a grain boundary effect on precision. As if the interaction volume contains a grain boundary, then basically you get a contribution from the lattice um, on either side of the grain boundary, as I've tried to show in this example, where you have a blue grain with one orientation, a red grain with another, and you can see the superposition of the patterns from those two grains um, in the mixed pattern center. And what that results in then is if you look at, at the right, um, I've used the Huff to try to find, um, in this case, we found six bands, two from uh, the blue grain and four from the red grain. Um, we're still able to index it. Obviously, there's a majority from the red grain, um, but it, uh, so it identifies the red grain as the correct solution. Now, if we do that, um, you, when we do indexing, we use all the, all the bands we use, we use to calculate the orientation. So we end up with kind of an average orientation, as we know that, that we're never going to get the uh, position of those bands perfectly precise. And so if you look at that for this grain, we have four contributing to the average orientation for the red grain, and three contributing to the average orientation for the blue grain, um, whereas, and we use triplets, so really just one contributing to the blue. Now, if we had a, a you know, a an orientation from a, or a pattern from a grain where there's really only right from the interior of the grain, then all seven contribute, and we have 35 triplets contributing to that average orientation, giving us a more precise measure. And you can see that effect um, in the EBSD measurements. As you get near the grain boundaries, the confidence index goes down, um, and that's an effect of the orientation precision. So do we believe the CAM results near the grain boundaries because of this effect? Well, one thing you can do is increase the number of, of bands that you use, and that certainly um, improves the precision um, at grain boundaries, you've noticed. Um, so we took a look at this cold rolled brass that I, I mentioned before <coughs> and looked at the cam results near the grain boundaries, and they do go up. Um, but from our measurements, if we look at a perfectly um, recrystallized material there, the black line, you can see it does go up in the grain boundaries, we suspect, due to the precision effect, but it's very slight. And so we do see some increase um, due to re reduced precision um, with increased dislocation density at the interiors of the grains. That's way out there at five. And you can see a slight rise. And we suspect that rise would be just about the same as we get near the grain boundaries. Um, and you can see, though, that it's much larger than that. So on the left, the arrow there is due to increased dislocation density. So yes, there is an effect near grain boundaries, but nonetheless, majority of it is due to um, dislocation density increase. So um, we take an ex we want to look at an example for um, real materials and the effect on the uh, G and D measurements. So we're going to add noise to the patterns um, artificially. And then we're going to use some of the cleanup routines we have to see if we can improve the strain measurements. So there's a simple one, Gaussian weighting, where we just uh, average the orientations together uh, nearby pixels. Uh, another one called the Kuohara filter, which is a little more complex. We look at the neighboring grains, look at the median um, or mean um, and standard deviation, and replace the center with that, which is a, a a well-known image processing technique, and 
that will relate will clean up the image but it can create artificially subgrain boundaries in this case it seems to fit well and there's one called a bilateral filter which is basically a mix of these two ideas um, so here's an example for a steel and you can see the cam on the right um, without any of this filtering and here's the effect of the cam if we do this filtering as I mentioned, the Kuwahara will bias towards subgrain boundary creation, and you can see that um, in the result there. The Gaussian is simply smoothest things out, the bilaterals and mix between the two. And in fact, if you play with the bilateral, all the different parameters, you can get it to either match the, the Kuwahara or just the Gaussian. Now, there's another technique we've, we've pioneered in recent years um, called NPAR, where we look at the average of the, we look at the patterns nearby. Of the neighboring points and we calculate an average one so we clean essentially clean up um, the pattern quality get a higher pattern quality for indexing so we can use that as a way of, of filtering and improving the orientation precision as well so we're going to do an, an experiment on 75 percent cold rolled copper once again i'm going to add some noise to this we're going to focus on the small step size gnds because those are the ones where noise is going to play the biggest role so what happens is you add noise so i've added noise to the patterns artificially it shifts this curve of the g and d densities to the right you'll see in the dashed line there and that's because our precision is dropped and we're getting basically it increases the number of small low angle boundaries now i've applied the different filtering schemes the kuwahara the bilateral the gauss and the NPAR technique and the good thing is is they all seem to return back to the original um, and I was actually surprised in doing this, how well this worked. Um, so if you do have concerns about precision, I guess my takeaway is that you can use these filters to try and improve things a little bit. We know all, we always have orientation north. And so it may be worthwhile doing that. Now, let's talk a little bit about Taylor and Schmidt factor analysis. Um, these basically are focused on slip systems and they help us understand our material. Now, the Schmidt factor is, is a pretty basic idea. You have a stress, um, which is equal to force over area. That's pretty simple. But if you have an on slip system, then we're going to resolve it to that slip system, have a resolved shear stress. And if you go through all this math, the point is at the bottom, this is a geometric effect. So we specify the slip system, and then using the Schmidt factor, we can, we can have an idea of how likely that, that slip system will be active or not. And so here's an example. The blue grain here um, is, is less likely to slip. Its slip system is not well-oriented. You can see the values there. Whereas the higher values, the red, are more likely to slip. And so you can see the difference there. Now, um, we can also use a Taylor factor, which considers the idea that slip is going to happen more likely to happen on multiple slip systems. Once again, you have a deformation gradient tensor like I kind of talked about earlier, where we look at a point in the original space versus the deformed space, tracking the same point. Um, from that, we can calculate a displacement gradient tensor and break that into uh, skew symmetric or symmetric and anti-symmetric parts like I talked about in the introduction. Um, so you have the elastic part and or a Cauchy string and the rigid body rotation. And similarly, in the crystal, you have that. And so you have a magnitude of slip on a slip system um, where you know the slip plane normal and the slip direction. So it looks like lots of math. And you come up with, but if you go through that, then you come up, Taylor's analysis requires we find a set of five slip systems which satisfy, um, that, which will maintain compatibility within the grain um, with the least amount of plastic work and achieve the strain necessary. And so you can go through various machinations and you end up with a Taylor factor and it tells us something about how uh, much effort it's going to take to strain the material. So here's slip on five slip systems, um, once again, for two different grains. And in this case, all five slip systems will be active. They have different amounts of slip on each slip system. Um, just so you know, the in this case, it's the opposite direction. The lower values are more likely to slip. So I've had to change the gradient. Uh, color gradient. So the inputs are the crystallographic orientation, which we obtain um, through EBSD measurements, 
Um, we also have to input the slip system interest, just some examples there, and the applied stress state. And so here's an example where I've assumed pencil glide in the one one directions for stainless steel. This is the example, in situ example we've shown before. And you can see there are some similarities, but it doesn't match up perfectly with what we expect from the GOS, what we would expect from a GOS measurement. Um, and this is because the local stress state is not the same as the bulk stress state. And so it's not perfect, but it does give us some ideas and we do see some correlations and it is a way to analyze the materials and to some kind of uh, crystallographic or, or slip model that help us understand what's happening in our material. Now, there are also some complementary techniques. We've focused on EBSD here, but I think more and more people are using different techniques to try to get at the complete picture, because what we have is only a partial picture with EBSD. Um, for one thing, it's, it's, it's a 2D, and there are other ways of doing that. So let me talk about some of these and how they relate to EBSD, because I think it's important, and we're stick, and we get a lot of, um, we get, get a lot of information from these. Um, so let me look at four, there are others, um, transmission electron microscopy, Kind of going in order of different uh, of resolution here. Um, ECCI, electron channeling contrast imaging. DIC, digital image correlation, or HRDIC is what I'm going to focus on, high resolution digital image correlation. And HEDM, high energy x ray diffraction microscopy. Um, sorry, need a drink there. <laughs> All right, so here's an example, uh, courtesy of uh, Tim Ruggles of Sandia National Lab and Josh Katcher of Georgia Tech. Um, these are bright field TEM images um, compared to this case HREBSD work that they've done. And so what you can see are some dislocation tangles um, in, with the blue arrows indicating that. You can also see a twin boundary in red. And you can also see a line of dislocations there that, um, indicated by the black arrow. Um, and different, so by aligning the G vectors um, differently, then, then you see different things in these images. But the key thing I want to show is that there is some correlation to the EBSD. Um, it's not one-to-one -one in terms of strength or whatever, but you can see these features. So the red arrow is that, that twin boundary. Um, the dislocation line there in black, you can see, shows up in the HREBSD. The, the dislocation tangles also show up. So we can look uh, with the TM, obviously, at higher resolution, and that gives us, we're getting a complementary picture of what's happening within our material, which is good news that we see similar features. Um, another one that I'm seeing much more um, in papers and at conferences is the use of electron channeling contrast imaging, ECCI. Um, in this, what you have to do is, is you can do this in the SEM, which is um, convenient as we can also, as EBSD is also an SEM-based technique, is that uh, you mount, you have the BSE detector mounted below the pole piece, and you lightly tilt the sample into a two-beam condition. This is going to be done at, typically at a much uh, higher or a smaller working distance, and you slightly tilt it, and if you get it in the right position, then you start to see the evidence for dislocations, individual dislocations. And you can see that in the picture at left, and then once again, HR EBSD on the right, trying to show GND densities. And you can see evidence uh, for these. It isn't one-to-one -one all the time, but we are seeing similarities, especially as you start to count the dislocations and get an idea of the density. Another one that I think is exciting and seeing more and more is uh, high resolution digital image correlation, HRDIC. Now, if you think in the macro sense, you, you, have, you apply some markers on your material, you strain it, and you watch and see how those markers move. That's a, a well known idea to get ideas of strain fields. Now, what's interesting for the high resolution is they've come up with techniques to put some kind of speckle pattern with another material down onto the surface. And then using image processing, you can see how those, those markers move. And now we're doing this down at the similar kind of resolutions that we see with HREBSD. 
And so you know how those move. So once again, you have a displacement field, and then you can turn that into some kind of intensity uh, mapping that I'm showing here. So this is Curtis de San Daly at UC Santa Barbara. And you can see the development of, of strain within the material as you, in, as you go through the strain process. This is, you can see the dog bone there, and you can see three measurements on the stress strain curve with A, B, and C, and then the strain field that developed in the microstructure. And if you do the EBSD prior to putting on the speckle pattern, then you can put on, map out the grain boundaries from the original measurement and see how things are changing. Um, and now the, those grain boundaries may have moved a bit because of the straining process, um, but what you're seeing is the overlay from the pre-strain um, applied, before the strain is applied. So how does this correlate to um, EBSD? measurements such as the CAM and G-ROD and others. Um, so this is courtesy of Professor Quintana de Fonseca at the University of Manchester. And Zhao has shown that in the DIC, what you're noting in this cartoon, that you, you catch the in-plane slip, the plastic rotation, the rigid body rotation with HRDIC. And then he's noted that if you use the two different types of uh, GRODs that we talk about, that you capture some for the GRD zero. So, in going back to in an in situ experiment where you have the pre and post um, orientation measurements, then you capture 3D plastic rotation and rigid body rotation as a misorientation, but not necessarily a deformation. Whereas with the EBSD, the G rod compared to the average orientation, you capture the plastic rotation, but no rigid body rotation. So this is an interesting way. It gives you different ideas of what you're seeing in the microstructure as you deform the grain. And just one more slide on the HRDIC. Here's, um, this is courtesy of one of Professor Fonseca's students, former students, Alan Hart. Um, and you see this uh, high resolution digital image correlation, beautiful map over quite a few grains. Um, you can see the strain is, is uh, horizontal there for tensile. I've tried to illustrate. And let's look at three different grains with different amounts and, and character of the uh, slip lines. So grain one is single slip, grain two double, grain three triple, grain four we start to see a significant cross slip. And then the last grain has somewhat of a diffuse uh, nature in its slip. And you can see both the, uh, the digital image correlated uh, measurements and the EBSD, in this case the GROD average measurements. And you can see some interesting features. I know when I look at them, I tend to see that the cross-slip areas tend to show uh, higher intensity in the G-Rod average. Um, but I haven't spent a lot of time with this, but it is an interesting result. Something to keep in mind, certainly. Now, uh, going up another level in resolution, there's also the high-energy X-ray diffraction microscopy. And this is increasing in re resolution as these uh, measurements as they've improved these measurements over time. This is results on, on Matt Miller's group, and one of his students, Kelly Nigren, at Cornell. And I think this is a really nice image. So what you see is, is a grain, or it, it's tracking the stress that develops within a grain uh, with strain. And you can see where this orientation is in, in Rodriguez space. So not only do you track the strain, but you can track the change in orientation. And so this could be, the nice thing is, is this is done in the bulk, so then we can start to compare this to EBSD measurements to, to check and see we're seeing the same thing in the bulk as at the surface. Um, but you can see in this that the colors indicating the uh, amount of strain in the material, and then you can also see the orientation moving um, within the grain. Um, so you, you capture the, both the, the development of strain with change, with orientation. So that is a nice, um, example as well. And once again, I uh, mentioned that I was at the TMS meeting this week um, in San Diego and saw lots of good examples both of, of this technique but also all the others. Um, some great talks using HRDIC, using HREBSD, using HEDM, um, using ECCI. And so all these techniques are at your disposal. Um, some are hard to use, some are easy to use, um, but there's certainly good work out there and people to partner with to, to improve these things and link everything together. So I hope what I've shown um, is that 
that elastic strain requires advanced techniques for measurement, the HREBSD cross correlation type results. It also requires good high resolution patterns, high quality patterns, um, and that's an area to, to explore. Um, with traditional um, conventional huff based EBSD measurements, we're able to look at plastic strain. Um, I've noted the GOS, CAM, and GROD, those tend to be the most common that I am seeing, um, but you do see some of the others used as well that I mentioned um, you can look up in the papers or the past webinar we gave. It's quantitative. It is step size dependent and, and sensitive to other calculation parameters. That's something to be aware of. And the sensitivity to the calculation parameters, I haven't spent a lot of time on here, but it is uh, part of the paper I mentioned. It's difficult to link EBSD results to absolute values of plastic stream. And I'll say that right out, but it is very useful as an indicator of local strain concentrations. Where is the strain um, building up um, within the microstructure? That kind of picture is, is EBSD is great for. Um, do be careful in interpreting the results, um, both in terms of orientation precision. And more, this is more goes to the quantitative uh, part of this, the absolute strain part, as, as opposed to, you know, the flow fields and indicators of local strain build up. Um, but you also need to be careful and not always assume that what you're seeing in the microstructure um, is that that's captured well, but how the material got there is not always well understood, not always captured. That has to be interpolated and inferred, um, although the in situ measurements can help understand that. Um, and then I also really want to point out the comparison with with dislocation slip models, the simple ones like the Schmidt and the Taylor factor are very useful for understanding your material. And then adding in other complementary characterization techniques can even further um, answer those questions that may still be out there. And so I think uh, as you read the scientific literature, you can see that these techniques are all giving us a better idea and we're learning more and more uh, as to how our materials are behaving and hopefully we can we can become even better at predicting and um, material behavior and understanding the, the, the linkage between uh, microstructure and properties. So with that, I will close the webinar. Um, there's lots of other resources we have at EDAX. Um, I encourage you to go to the website. You can see the webinars, have fun reading the blogs, um, and there's other places to look. And of course, there's always the scientific literature um, out there and hopefully we link you to some of that as well. So with that, I'll, I'll take a look. A um, couple of questions, if we can. I uh, can't answer them all, but we can certainly um, reply to you by email. Um, so there's a good question um, about uh, which I have not talked about, and that is essentially resolution. What are the smallest grains we can measure with EBSD? And it's going to differ from material to material, um, and also on the microscope the capabilities that, that you have. Um, it's, you know, grains uh, larger than a micron are pretty straightforward. As we get smaller than that, then that starts to become a bigger issue. Um, but we can usually get down to grain sizes, um, say, um, conservatively down to 50 nanometers or yeah and then if you need more resolution go to uh, TKD transmission Kikuchi diffraction which we also have some presentations on and webinars so look at that for going to higher resolution um, or to smaller grain sizes um, I do make the point while we can image a small grain say a 50 nanometer grain. The problem is, is if you're going to do any types of strain work, then you're going to need enough measurements within the grain to get at the strain field, to capture those, those local misorientation changes. So you may need to go to a, uh, you may not be able to do 50 nanometer grains, and while you can image them, you may not be able to capture the, the strain within those. Uh, it looks like there's quite a few questions here, so I think we'll have to, um, probably try to take a look at maybe a couple more. You've all asked some very good questions. <laughs> um, 
There, there's a good question about in situ experiments. Um, and that is, is that we basically, it's a dynamic process. And so deformation, we have to stop it and measure, um, you know, scan area. So the material will relax a little bit. Um, in terms of dealing with this effect, obviously we want to go as fast as possible so that we reduce this effect. So there's kind of a couple of things at issue there. One is we want to go fast, so we want to use maybe a faster camera. The challenge is as we go faster, sometimes we can lose some precision, so there's a, you have to find a balance there. But certainly we want to go fast, so um, you probably want to use a lot of current and, and so that you can go fast and get a good measurement. But you may also want to um, think about your step size and the scan area you're going to cover. You noticed in the in-situ measurements I showed we only captured a few grains, focused our analysis on one big grain. And so it might be worth doing multiple samples um, in, so that you can do it fast and do small areas. Um, and that way you can get more grain orientations involved um, by covering multiple samples as opposed to covering one sample or, or one area on the sample. So that is something to think about, uh, certainly a good point. Uh, be careful as you mix these different images, make sure you understand the colors. Um, for example, in an IPF map, blue is, refers to a certain orientation, but in a CAM, blue, at least by the default uh, grain coloring schemes we use, blue will be um, basically the lowest deviation, so closest, for example, in a GROD map, it would be closest to the original orientation or to the average orientation whereas blue in a CAM map is just an area with low uh, misorientation, whereas blue in an IPF map refers to the um, 111 orientation. So uh, the colors don't just transfer from one to another. You need to be think a little bit about and, and check and make sure you're using a color scheme that works. A great example is the Schmidt and Taylor factors. So in the Schmidt factor, uh, you know, it goes, the sorry, the highest is the is means it will slip, whereas in Taylor factor it's the opposite. So you might want to use opposite color gradients if you're going to compare those two results. So that's something to think about as well. Um, one point I'm seeing several questions about SSDs. Um, I'm sorry I must not have explained that well. Local misorientations we are. So SSDs will not produce local misorientation. So basically, you have rotations that are canceling each other out. And so EVSD will not pick up SSDs. You will see it in the quality of the patterns, but that's a little harder to be quantitative about. Um, and so SSDs are something we miss. What we do pick up are the GNDs. So that is something that, that you should be aware of. Um, so with that, I thanks for your attention. We'll, I'll go ahead and address the, the rest of these by email. Thanks again for, especially those of you who've asked questions, thanks for asking questions, and, and hopefully we can get you answers that, that can help you understand uh, for your materials and, and the challenges that you're facing. So thanks again, and uh, tune in. Uh, we'll be having a seminar webinar again, um, more on an EDS topic next time, but we'll certainly have EBSD ones in the future and hope that you enjoy those as well. Thanks again.